Discover with Dr. Dan, the Proactive Health Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Brilliant, an innovative proactive wellness company. Brilliant helps people to live a healthier and happier life by discovering and using bioactive natural ingredients to formulate products that help them discover and unleash their innate brilliance. See philbrilliant.com for more information. Today, it's a delight to have Brundy Brody with us on the show to talk about an enzyme that we probably haven't heard of, calcium ATPase, and its impact on human health. So a little bit about Brundy. When Brundy Brody's infant son experienced an onslaught of health issues that conventional medicine could neither define nor treat, she began her own research-based quest for answers. Over the course of 10 years, she pulled together hundreds of threads from scientific journals and revealed the importance of the enzyme calcium ATPase. Brody has a Yale MBA and has received patents in both the United States and China related to her work on calcium ATPase. Her goal is to share her knowledge with as many people as possible to help them make educated health and lifestyle decisions. And she's wrote a great book called The Calcium Connection, and here's some info on that. Did you know that one single enzyme impacts your odds of contracting most deadly diseases and health conditions? An enormous body of reputable research into this enzyme has been isolated, ignored, and misunderstood by medical experts. The importance of this enzyme simply cannot be overstated. The calcium connection, the little known enzyme at the root of your cellular health, delivers a clear explanation of this enzyme's function and outlines the steps you could take to gain optimal enzyme health. The accessible information packed format teaches you all about calcium ATPase, how it works, what happens when it goes awry, and easy practical methods to bring it back into balance and protect it and your overall health. Whether you are a health enthusiast, environmentalist, parent, or just want to be better informed, this book will help you boost your health now and into the future. Brundy Brody recounts her tireless quest to find a cure for her son's Knut's compromised health since being whisked away and kept in the ICU after birth. The medical establishment could only help manage his condition, but not diagnose or cure him. Doing her own research and documenting everything Knut ate and his reactions to certain foods, she came across two ubiquitous food additives. Diving deeper, she learned how calcium ATPase, a fundamental regulator of intercellular calcium, is negatively impacted not only by these additives, but by a torrent of other inhibitors. Knut's health is a testimony to Brundy's discoveries, and the calcium connection gives readers a front row seat to understanding how to maintain optimized cellular health. With that, Brundy, it's sure a delight to have you on the show with us. Thanks for having me, and you did a great job summary my, summarizing my work, so thank you. Wonderful. Sounds like an amazing book, and uh, we're excited to learn a little bit more about calcium ATPA. So to start off, what is this enzyme that most of us haven't heard about? Okay, so when most people think of calcium, they think of bones and teeth, right? So there's 2.2 right. pounds of calcium in our body, but a teaspoon and a half are in our blood and our cells. And what most people don't know is the rise and fall of calcium levels within your cells is like a traffic signal. It controls all cell functions. And what calcium ATPase does is a special enzyme whose only job it is to regulate calcium levels within the cells. So if it's not working properly, it's as if your traffic signals in your body aren't working properly, which you know can cause all sorts of mayhem. So no one really, there's been 25,000 journal articles published about its importance, but for some reason it hasn't filtered down. And what's important is there's things we can do in our life to help maximize our levels. So tell us a little bit about uh, your story of how you got into this in the first place, into this body of research. Right. So my background was in finance, so I had no plan to go into this. But my son was, you know, I had a lidocaine um, anesthesia or whatever you want to call pain relief, Uh um, not knowing that that was a calcium ATPase inhibitor. But anyway, he was whisked off to the emergency, I mean, to the ICU for a week, came home with an apnea monitor because he would kind of have these breathing, stop breathing, swallowing problems, neuromuscular problems, pneumonia, aspirations, Mm -hmm. all these things. And I was so naive. You know, before he came home, I had the nursery painted. I had new carpets put down. I had the floors turned up. I Uh fed him formula. You know, Pedialyte with dyes, you know, erythromycin with dyes. Um, And what I ended up noticing was that his symptoms got worse when he either ate or was exposed to these things. So slowly but surely, I put together a list of things that affected him. And I went online, and there were some others who had the same experience, but I wanted to know why. Mm -hmm. 
So I kind of focused on his muscle function, which was really evidenced by his eyelids droop, which is called ptosis. So I learned about how calcium, how muscles work, and calcium regulation within muscle cells was key. Yep. And then I began to research on PubMed, which is the place where there's all the medical journal articles. And mm-hmm. sure enough, everything that he was sensitive to had a negative effect on this enzyme that was crucial for calcium regulation, which is calcium ATPase. So I got him settled. But in the meantime, I was kind of like, I want to learn more. And what I found was that it's important for every single human being on Earth because mm-hmm. it's in every single cell of our body. And guess what? Low levels are associated with a ton of health problems like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's. So I'm like on a mission to tell people about calcium ATPase and some of the exciting things you can do to help avoid reducing it and maximize your levels. Wow. Well said. Um, so jumping right in, if we want to help to regulate our calcium uh, ATPase levels, this uh, biosignaling regulator in the body, what are some things that we can do? Okay, so the first thing you can do is try to reduce your exposure to toxins. And that means just like the traditional ones like lead, lead mercury, cadmium, etc., pesticides, but also things you may not know about, such as food additives, BHT, TBHQ, food dyes, potassium bromate, and things that you may not have thought of, like aluminum when you cook with acidic foods such as um, barbecue sauce or tomatoes that causes aluminum to leach into your foods, Mm -hmm. sunscreens with titanium dioxide nanoparticles, um, sushi, tuna tuna sushi has super high levels of mercury. So in my book, I have a ton of different checklists, and you don't have to do all of them, right? Right. Every one that you do is positive for calcium ATP. So that's one part, toxin reduction. The second thing was really exciting, which is there's all these foods you can eat that have compounds that actually have been shown to stimulate calcium ATPase. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it kind of includes all the superfoods you know about, like strawberries, nuts, um, you know, pomegranate, uh, spinach, kale. But the exciting thing is there's actually research done that these compounds like elic acid, mm-hmm. liposine, resveratrol, all green tea, ginger, all have been shown actually in research studies to stimulate this compound. Um, The the third thing is blood sugar, because high blood sugar is the enemy of calcium ATPase, which we all know is is bad. Number four is exercise. There's all types of exercise stimulate calcium ATPase. And the last plank is stress reduction, because stress hormones reduce calcium ATPase. So there's a lot of things you can do. But at the same time, there's a ton of, I'm also involved in biotech companies. Okay. There's a ton of things coming down the road that can, um, if you already have a problem, it can help. But in the meantime, there's these supplements like you have with your brilliant um, Connect supplement that has all, a lot of different compounds like green tea, um, resveratrol, um, let's see. Uh, pomegranate, um, just a lot of things. So in the meantime, there are supplements you can take that really support calcium ATPase, and it's such a crucial enzyme that anything you can do to support it is a worthwhile um, endeavor. Yeah, it's amazing to think about these signaling mechanisms in the body that control the, the millions or trillions of chemical reactions that occur every single second. So with calcium ATPase, uh, if, if I want to help it, would I take a calcium supplement? Would that help? No, so that's kind of, I mean, that's why it's, it's kind of a confusing thing because um, calcium levels within your blood are separate from calcium levels within your cell. Mm-hmm. There is an interaction because when there's too much calcium in the cell, it's pumped out of the cell into the bloodstream. Um, but unless you're taking like mega doses of calcium, it's not going to affect how much calcium is within the cell. Okay. So it's kind of everything i mean calcium is clearly important right for bones and teeth Mm -hmm. but in terms of this particular enzyme it's surprisingly not relevant okay um what about magnesium i know calcium and magnesium sometimes go together right so magnesium basically acts as a calcium channel blocker Mm -hmm. so the reason why that helps with your blood sugar and relaxation is because when too much calcium gets into a cell it causes um, for example, muscle contraction. So what magnesium does is it blocks the flow of calcium into the cell, kind of like calcium channel blockers. Okay. Um, so that's one way, because when you have too much calcium in a cell, it can cause damage to the cell. 
So calcium ATPase works in concert with magnesium because it's just another tool the body has to to um, regulate the calcium level within the cells. I mean, in one way, they kind of both do the same thing, which is lower calcium levels back to baseline, but, uh-huh. but they have different mechanisms. Okay. And so the whole point of this, as you were saying, is to, is to push calcium out to get it to normal levels and to keep equilibrium in the cell. Right. So uh, the other thing that calcium ATPase does that magnesium doesn't do is mm-hmm. that it pumps calcium into these storage vesicles within the cells. And they have a fancy name called the endoplasmic reticulum. Mm-hmm. But just, just, just know they're storage vesicles. And the reason why that's important is not only because it lowers calcium within the cells, but the endoplasmic reticulum needs a certain amount of calcium not to be stressed. Mm. And if it's stressed, it can't do its job, which is fold proteins such as insulin and all sorts of different things. So calcium ATPase lowers calcium levels, and it also maintains endoplasmic reticulum equilibrium. And if that's off, it can lead to so many different diseases. So it, it has an extra, an extra role that magnesium doesn't have. Okay. Wow. So... If I want to, what role does exercise? So you said exercise can help. Is there a certain type of exercise that I want to do in order yeah, to maintain? The good, the good news, yeah, the good news is that moderate aerobics, um, high intensity training, as well as strength training, have all been shown to stimulate calcium ATPase in the skeletal muscles in the heart, and that's really important for everybody because as you age, your levels go down, and what that means is it's harder for your your heart to contract and relax and you have less of muscle strength. Mm -hmm. Um, So high intensity level training shows the most benefit, but the other ones do as well. So any kind of exercise you can do can only be a plus for calcium ATPase. And you actually can increase your levels of calcium ATPase, which is so cool, no matter what your age. Oh, that's cool. And so how would we do that? Is that via exercise or are there other things? So, I mean, so in terms of exercise, I mean, the studies have been done, you know, basically three to five times a week, um, 30 minutes of aerobic or Mm -hmm. uh, weight training, three times eight repetitions. But it's kind of like what we all know we should do, right? Um, But if you do it consistently, it's been shown in research studies in particular to stimulate calcium ATPase. Of course, it does a lot of other great things, too. Okay. Um, what, what about diet? I know you mentioned a lot of the really cool fruits and vegetables, which have these uh, medicinal compounds, these phytonutrients in there. As far as uh, uh, macronutrients, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, are there certain certain ratios, different uh, diets out there? That, yes, that... And the main thing to avoid is high blood sugar, because what mm-hmm. happens in high blood sugar is the high level of sugar that's something called glycation, and it attaches itself to proteins, which you probably know, like A1C levels, right, measure the attachment of sugar to hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. Well, it also does the same thing to the protein calcium ATPase. So high blood sugar is the enemy of calcium ATPase, and there's a lot of ways to approach high blood sugar, right? There's paleo, keto, Mediterranean, or simply reducing your carbs. So, And I think even just the... um, you know, the continuous glucose monitoring patch is useful just in terms of kind of getting a handle on how you as an individual respond. But blood sugar is just crucial. Not that you can't have high blood sugar, you know, every once in a while, but you just don't want to have it several times every day because it's terrible for, for calcium ATPase. Okay. And so complications like diabetes, where uh, sugar levels are always high, does that exacerbate? It's a disaster because yeah. one thing, it, the, the first step is that it reduces calcium ATPase in the pancreas. Mm-hmm. And because there's this overload of calcium in the pancreatic beta cells, it leads to cell death. So you have less insulin being produced. But what happens is because you have less insulin being produced, you have higher blood sugar, right? Mm -hmm. And that blood sugar attaches to the calcium ATPase. And what they found is that diabetics have like 50% lower calcium ATPase levels than the normal person. But Mm -hmm. more importantly, that affects their heart, that affects their kidneys, that affects neuropathy, that affects their brain, that affects their muscles. So reduced calcium ATPase is like, diabetes is like a fast forward version of if you have low calcium ATPase. The damage okay. occurs in the body. But what's exciting is that compounds have recently been developed that stimulate calcium ATPase in diabetic mice. Okay. And what happens is their blood sugar levels are normalized. 
the damage to the heart, their nerves, et cetera, is minimized. So it's clearly a target, but in the meantime, you know, ideally you would be able to prevent this from ever happening by taking care of your own calcium ATPase. Okay. But there is some good hope in terms of people that have already stepped over that bridge that this is a way that can be really helpful. Okay, and are these pharmaceutical um, drugs in development, or, or what is yeah, this? Yeah, they are. In fact, in mm-hmm. fact um, so in my research, I came across this, this researcher, Dr. Rob Russell Dahl, and he was like had been into calcium ATPase for more than a decade, just like okay. me, mm-hmm. and he needed funding to conduct his research, mm-hmm. and I joined in, and since that time, um, Mount Sinai, Harvard Medical School recently partnered with us for wow. diabetes, Alzheimer Foundation, um, gave us a grant because it's shown promise in Alzheimer's. And kind of like most exciting to me is just in the last month, um, Japanese researchers used our compound and were able to reduce, actually eliminate muscle damage and chain muscular dystrophy, which is that terrible disease right. for the kids. So, mm-hmm. and, and I'm one drop in the ocean. There's a million other researchers doing the same thing. But what's exciting is that this particular target calcium ATPase is really a key factor in health because it controls every cell. Uh-huh. So down the road, there'll be pharmaceuticals, but in the meantime, there's things we can do. Okay. And so these pharmaceuticals, do they bind to the calcium ATPase active site, an active site? Yeah, so basically they stimulate the activity of it. They're okay. called small molecule cell activators. Mm-hmm. So they don't actually increase the amount of calcium ATPase, they increase their its activity. And by doing so, again, it prevents that toxic calcium overload. Okay. That's one part. The second part is it prevents endoplasmic reticulum stress. And what happens when there's endoplasmic reticulum stress, it ends up having a cascade, which is kind of like a death spiral where uh-huh. it triggers a cell to die. So like in Alzheimer's, when you have endoplasmic reticulum stress, that's when you lose neurons, mm-hmm. right? In diabetes, that's when you lose pancreatic cells. And muscular dystrophy, even though... Um, dystrophin is the main problem, that protein, because of those leaks in that protein, excess calcium gets in the cell, which ends up causing cell death. So if you can stimulate calcium ATPase, it can prevent that overload. So so calcium ATPase, the, the most important thing it does is it prevents endoplasmic reticulum stress, which, which leads to cell death. Okay. It's irreversible, so to speak. Right. Wow, this this is good stuff. So um, you mentioned some of the work you're doing. Where do you think the future is to research with calcium ATPase and uh, h- human health in general? What what we can do? All right. So um, so there's been a lot of studies with gene transplant where they use a virus to you know for the heart and also for different muscles and blood vessels and and muscular dystrophy. And there's been a lot of positive results, mm-hmm. but. It seems to be hard to convert those animal studies to human studies. Yeah. So, you know, in small studies, it's shown a benefit. So, so now researchers are looking at a different way, i.e. small molecules that stimulate calcium ATPase. And there's mm-hmm. actually some new heart failure drugs out that one of their modes of action. So, and also the, the Harvard researchers that, that we ended up hooking up with, I was drawn to them because the guy implanted a chip Mm-hmm. into mice that were overweight, right? A small yeah. chip that was, had a wireless connection to something. And by pushing the button, it stimulated calcium ATPase. And the mice ended up, their metabolic rate went up like 20% in 10 minutes. Wow. And like So whenever you, anyone is obese, the, uh, your obesity is negatively correlated with your BMI. And mm-hmm. the reason why is that Calcium ATPase is responsible for about 15% of your total metabolic rate. Okay. So there's a lot of positive things that could happen down the road in terms of research for obesity, you know, diabetes, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and, um, and, and that's, I mean, it's such an obvious target because like you say, cellular function is key. And when that's off, everything is, can go haywire, right? right. Um, but but also, there, you know, there's more and more studies that show these natural compounds, right? Green tea, the yep. components of green tea, gingerol, ginkgo, resveratrol, um, lutololin, elic acid, you know, that you can either take as a supplement or eat in your foods. You know, it's not just, oh, gee, we know these are good for us. It's, oh, these are positive calcium ATPase supplements. 
Yeah. So there's a lot of things that, and, and also just avoiding the toxins, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, because one exposure is not going to get you, but if you add up 25 exposures to calcium ATPase inhibitors, it's going to add up, right? Right. And it's especially important for children because calcium ATPase is crucial to neurodevelopment. So, okay. um, you know, they've done a test where they expose neurons in the different prenatal periods to calcium ATPase inhibitors. Okay. And it prevents neuron growth, neuron complexity, and also neuron neuron um, pathways. So, like, that's what happens in uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. That's what happens with mercury poisoning, lead poisoning. The mechanism of action is the reduction of calcium ATPase in the mm. brain. So you don't want to be giving your kids... Or exposing your kids to all these things that have ultimately the same net effect as lead or mercury, even if it's on a, on a lower level, because mm-hmm. that all adds up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another aspect that's, you know, just for me, it's really a mission for parents to understand that. Um, and again, not that you have to be perfect, but just to kind of have a framework for making your decisions so that you can splurge. When, like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups is TBHQ. Right. Pillsbury Cookie Dough, Sugar Cookie Dough, Rice Krispie Treat, TBHQ. Mm-hmm. Orbit Gum, Trident Gum, TBHQ. So there's all these things I list a lot in my book that you think, you know, wouldn't be so bad. But the reality is it all adds up. Right. So, you know, just to the extent that you can be aware of that, you can just, you know, it's kind of like a bank account. You have calcium ATPs, you can make deposits or withdrawals. Yeah. And the goal is to make more deposits <laughs> than withdrawals, right? I love the um, example. So, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the goal in my book. Um, certainly not to be judgmental. I mean, even to this day, my son's 20 and wow. time to time he goes off and... It means eating things that are bad for him with right. this. He pays the price, and then you know naturally he goes back on because it's not worth it. But you know you have right. to leave room for human, you know, for being human. Right. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's hard to change things uh, completely. Yeah, for sure. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, Brundy, this has been a delight talking with you. Any final uh, thoughts you would leave with us? Um, you know, just really just the awareness of this enzyme and how important it is for every cell function and for your health. And, you know, if you go to my website, brundybrody.com, you can learn more about it. And if you want to learn more, you can get my book. But I think that no matter what, um, you'll learn something new that could be good for your health. And, um, and that's my goal. I'm not selling anything. I'm just trying to get the information out there. Oh, fantastic. Thank you for your mission. We need a lot more people like you that uh, help to get out a critical scientific information that the, the general public doesn't know about. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners. Uh, leave a review if you like this content uh, about learning more how to live proactively and take care. This is Dr. Dan signing off. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. The information presented by guests in this podcast is their sole opinion and in no way represents the views of Discover with Dr. Dan, the Proactive Health Podcast, or Brilliant. This podcast is for informational purposes only and does not replace professional medical care. Please consult with your medical doctor before making any changes in your lifestyle.